again, welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand, and today we're over at the Sprinkler Factory in Worcester, and we, it's at 38 Harlow Street, and there's a very, really big show here of uh, an artist, Sid Solomon. It's called Sid Solomon, The First 80 Years. And uh, Sid, thanks for being here today and uh, letting us film your show. Um, I have to congratulate you. Uh, 80 years is a, a long time to be in the arts, and I congratulate you on a life in the arts. Um, you started off in the Worcester area? Yes. Uh, I went to the Worcester schools, and I started doing pictures there, and then I went to high school, and uh, from there I got a, a scholarship to go to the Worcester Art Museum School. And I went there for three years. I love that uh, painting that you have in your early work uh, where you're showing a painting you did at the Worcester Art Museum. Yes, uh, I have a few pieces left from that period. Uh, the painting is uh, done in the studio of uh, one of my classmates painting the model. And uh, it was... Uh, fairly successful, and I, I kept it all these years. And you got your degree, your undergraduate degree, from Clark? Yes. Uh, Through I, the museum? I got a scholarship. They had a scholarship uh, for mu museum students at Clark. So I went to, to the museum, and I would take one course a year at Clark. And then when I finished three years at the museum, I went full-time to Clark for one year and got my BA. Yeah. with a major in art. Uh, so you've been, uh, has, has painting the figure been one of your strongest areas? I see that we're standing near some figure paintings. Is, uh, is there a subject matter that you prefer? Well, I, in the early years I, I had an ambition to be a uh, successful portrait painter. But uh, that never worked out because uh, portraiture is uh, really too limited, and uh, I have a wide variety of interests. So, although I still like to do portraits and figure paintings, I also do other kinds of painting now. And uh, whatever there's the demand for, I, I try to paint. Mm -hmm. I notice that your portraits are really, I think, very, very strong, and you're, you have that classical training. Uh, in, in portraiture, and uh, you studied at the Corcoran and taught there for a while, and, and then uh, he got his uh, doctorate also in art. Tell me what the doctorate was again. Oh, uh, my doctorate I got at the University of Georgia, and it's in art theory and criticism, mm -hmm. because they don't give doctorates in studio art. That's true. That's very true. Let's look at a couple of the portraits. Do you want to tell us about uh, uh, your background in portraiture and what you go for and any, what in particular? Were these uh, models or, or paid the, for? Well, I studied at the Corcoran for three years and uh, I studied with a man named Edmund Archer who was a nationally known portrait painter because uh, before I went there I was down in Florida and I was doing portraits on the beach or in store windows down there in Miami Beach. He had a very colorful career. He traveled around the country. He lived in D.C. and Florida and Georgia and all around the South doing portraiture, I understand. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, uh, I got fairly good, but I, I felt like I needed more training in painting and portraits and oil. And I came upon a, a brochure with pictures uh, of stuff from the Corcoran faculty paintings, and uh, this man, Archer, struck me as a very competent portrait painter, and uh, so uh, we moved up to D.C., and I started studying at the Corcoran, where he had uh, a studio on the top floor with a skylight that ran the whole length of the building, and uh, at one end of the big studio, he had a setup for portraiture, and at the other end, he had a setup for painting uh, figure paintings, painting nudes. And uh, 
So I got to learn how to do both, with, and they're closely related, of course. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, These have especially nice skin tones. You know, I love the way you're modeling this skin tone with the warm and cool and really uh, nice, lively skin tones. Plus, a, mm -hmm. such a nice design with the, the striped background is very striking. Yeah, well, the uh, skin tones are very interesting. Um, these paintings are underpainted. They're what they call indirect painting, where you do an underpainting in monochrome, a warm underpainting, and then you put the color on top in glazes and scumbles so that the uh, underpainting shows through in places. And uh, when you put a skin tone over a, a warm underpainting, you get a cool tone, an optical gray, it's called. And uh, that's what I tried to get in some of these. And also, the skin seems to breathe a little bit and have, instead of having to mix that dark tone into the skin tone, you get it underneath so that the f surface tone is more lively, don't you think? Yes. Well, the figure is uh, very demanding, and uh, it's the hardest thing for an artist to learn to draw and paint because uh, people uh, know what uh, a person is supposed to look like. And uh, if you draw a figure and something is not quite right, of course, people pick, on it, pick up on it immediately, where, whereas if you do the same thing in a still life or a landscape, uh, it wouldn't be so noticeable. So the portrait is really the hardest thing, and the figure, because you have to get it right. But I, I, my teacher used to say the same thing, and I say it now. If you make the tree an extra few inches wide, it doesn't matter. But if you make the nose a couple inches <laughs> wider, it does. <laughs> you have to get the angle right. The branch of the tree could be a little bit off, but nobody's going to question it but not the angle on the nose. Absolutely. So this, this is your self-portrait? Yes, I usually work from life. Most of these paintings were done from life, but uh, this is uh, done from a photograph, of course, mm -hmm. uh, which a friend of mine took, and I liked it so much that I decided that I'd make it into a portrait, but uh, mm -hmm. I didn't want an ordinary portrait. Uh, if you notice, I, I stretched the, uh, when I enlarged it, I stretched the uh, head. Yeah, the it's whole a little bit elongated. Elongated a little bit just to make it a little more interesting. I'm so glad we have a model today. This is Eleanor Beattie, and she has volunteered to come in and be the uh, model for Sid today. Thanks a lot, Eleanor. I'm glad to have you here. I'm very happy to be here, and I have modeled before for Sid at the in Shrewsbury, in Northborough, actually, at the Northborough Art Guild. And you're an art artist yourself, and you have, she's also an educator who taught in the city of Worcester for many years. Yes, retired in 99, and um, I've known Sid since the early 90s, and he's a, a great inspiration to me and to, I think, all who he associates with in the art community of Worcester he's and got a great the area. Influence. A yes. great influence on many in the community mm -hmm. who have told me he's their mentor and everything. Right, exactly. Right. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Here I am drawing a profile sketch, uh, which I used to do at arts and craft shows all around the South on weekends. Put myself through graduate school doing this. Um, I like to start at the top of the head and work my way around, drawing very carefully when I get to the features so that they're in the correct proportion and uh, located in the right relationship to each other. Um, now I'm trying to find out where the back of the head is. Don't want to make it too narrow or too wide. If it's too narrow, it's called a bean head. Um, and then uh, after I've gotten the outline of the head, I try to work into the interior and locate uh, the features. And this takes uh, a little time, but uh, it has to be done correctly because that's where the likeness lies. 
Ellie is a good model. She holds still, and uh, she's facing into the light. So uh, the left side of the head is going to be the light side, and the right side will be the shadow side. Now I've got the outline pretty well, and uh, I'm ready to start putting in some modeling. I decided I would do this sketch in chalks, uh, which is uh, a method of drawing somewhere between uh, line and uh, pastel. So I'm using uh, flesh colored chalk to fill in the lights and I'm also going to use white chalk for the highlights and uh, I have a gray, a dark gray and a dark black. Since I only have a few colors I'll have to make do and use uh, some of the flesh colored chalk to model the clothing. Now I'm putting in the hair and the light on the hair is the lightest part of the picture and her hair is uh, very beautiful and uh, thick and lustrous and catches the light very well. You, it's important to do uh, women's hair as well as possible because they take a lot of pride in it and it uh, makes the picture look um, more interesting if it's well done. I'm using some of my dark gray to model the hair in the back and I'm bringing up the highlight as high as possible on the hair in the front. Now I'm putting some highlights on the face using the white chalk. Now here we have some examples of Sid's plein air painting and you really do a lot of plein air painting, don't you? Yeah, we go out, my friends and I, all year round um, when the weather permits and uh, we paint uh, scenes that they've painted for many years. Some of them uh, know all the places that are good to paint in uh, Worcester County and, and this area. Motif number one. <laughs> well, this is what I like recognize particularly. This. <laughs> well, I've painted this several times. Uh, I really enjoy doing it. It's such a nice, easy subject, and uh, people like it. It's also nostalgic, and it's a nice. Uh, yeah, and it so, may not, do you ever work from photographs? May not be here that long. Who the, knows? The diner might not. Yeah. Well, uh, I have worked from photographs in the past, mostly. When I was in Florida painting portraits, uh, sometimes I, uh, I had to paint from photographs, although I don't prefer it. And I try not to work from photographs. I, I work almost entirely from, from the actual objects. And also, you have the life drawing group for many years. Uh, Sid ran the uh, life drawing at Worcester State for how many years was that? Well, it started in the mid-70s at the Grove Street Gallery, and uh, when the gallery closed, we moved it over to uh, Worcester State, where it was until uh, the last few years, and then Just we, a couple uh, of years ago. Is yeah, the, uh, when uh, Worcester State moved their art department to the craft center, they didn't have room for the life drawing, so uh, we w looked around and uh, were fortunate enough to uh, be able to put it on at the uh, art museum 
the Worcester Art Museum, took it over as a, an open studio for several years, but uh, right now it's uh, not being held. So that's a need that could be filled in the community now, is to have some place where people can go and draw from life on a regular basis. Yes, we would start, we would like to start it again if we could find a proper venue. So they're looking for a venue. And uh, I know I went to the Worcester State one many times and it was always very nice uh, experience to just have a model mm -hmm. to, to draw for the evening. Great. We have a large group that are interested in doing it. Yeah. So uh, there's one more group I think we can show, and that is um, the group that's a little bit more uh, abstracted subject matters. Let's look at those. Well, here's a familiar motif uh, you'll all recognize from Elm Park. Are you always using oils? No, uh, I uh, work in many media, watercolor, pastel, charcoal, but your paintings are primarily oil, not acrylic. Yes, uh, I, I do very few acrylics. Uh, I don't like the medium, but yeah, I, it's a it's a tricky medium. I find oil uh, does everything I want it to do. Good, okay. And uh, you, here we're moving down. I I really like a lot of your sculptural work too. Uh, this is I like the way you hung this, or placed it rather in your installation. I like the way this sort of geometric, uh, cubistic planes of this head go with the paintings that are there. But it's a very nice, this is clay, right? That's great, Just clay. clay. And uh, very nice modeling of the planes. And you have ceramics and uh, fig ceramic figures, ceramic vessels. The show is quite extensive. It, well, naturally it is, covers 80 years. Well, Sid is a master of many materials, as you can see in many media. Here we have some uh, Asian brush painting. How long have you been uh, doing that? I, I did it for three or four years. I was studying with a, a man at the Worcester Art Museum called uh, Jan Zaremba, who uh, was a German who studied in, uh, in China and Japan under uh, masters of this kind of painting, and uh, he was a very talented fellow, and he did wonderful pieces, and he was a good teacher. And uh, I learned a lot from him, and I've done these paintings and a number of others. And the technique is very interesting. It's very different than Western watercolor painting. They're done with uh, Oriental Chinese ink on uh, absorbent rice paper and uh, the technique is demanding because you cannot make any changes and when you put the ink down on the paper it spreads so the longer uh, you hold the brush the bigger the shape gets because it's sucking up the water that's right you have to be able to control the amount of ink in the brush and be able to execute the stroke perfectly so it's very good discipline and a very good way to learn how to handle the brush and the shape of the brush mark. That's the true. The shape of the brush mark. And also saying a lot with a little. Yes. And I just love the piece, uh, this piece with the deer in the snow because there are literally six or seven strokes that make up the whole flock of deer, <laughs> herd mm. of deer. It's Com lovely. Compositionally, the, uh, the signature is very important. It uh, balances the composition, and you have to be very careful where you place it in the picture. And uh, so um, yes, you learn a lot about composition from doing this kind of painting. Absolutely. And as you say, brush control. Good. I love them. Yeah. So these are interesting because this painting in that sort of cubistic uh, broken planes reminds me very much of that little portrait head, the little clay head we just looked at. Mm -hmm. But uh, so these pieces are more abstracted and um, are they done from life as well? Yes, uh, all these paintings are done from life. I uh, have developed a, a method of abstracting from uh, what I see out in the field, outdoor painting, which uh, 
is quite unusual because very few people paint abstracts uh, outside the studio. But uh, this this works for me, and it, mm -hmm. and it seems to it seems that the subject kind of determines uh, the treatment. Uh, some subjects I always start abstract, no matter what I'm painting. But, to get uh, a good layout of shapes on the, get the on design, the paint, yeah. yeah. But uh, as the painting evolves, uh, sometimes it remains abstract, and sometimes it becomes more realistic. Well, there's a certain heightened color. Uh, palette, and uh, even though some are pa like this is a pastel, right? Or is no, it? it's an oil. Oh, it's an oil. Yeah. It really. I thought it was a pastel for a minute because <laughs> it yeah. has that little strokey kind of softness. Yeah. Interesting. So, but it is quite abstracted. Very interesting. Has a nice. Uh, all of your uh, compositions always work, and your color harmonies, and obviously you know what you're doing. Well, that's what I get from working from the abstract to the realistic or the abstract to the abstract. And I think from working from life so much for all these years, you learn color, you learn relationships of color, you learn all those things which nature provides. So well, you have to have an eye for abstract relations in nature, because nature is a, a big chaotic mess mostly. and. Uh, if you look at a scene, sometimes you see uh, an interesting arrangement of light or color, and uh, it can be developed into a painting, which has to remain within the format of the, uh, the shape, the subject, rather than yeah. extending out yes. into nature. So it's not, they're not fragments, they're organized into paintings. Yes, I think that's a really, really important point that you make that when you look at nature, you have to somehow see the relationship of shapes and colors and sizes and directions so that when you put it into a painting, it holds together and has cohesion. And that's true. And that's what you're able to do, obviously. Um, okay, well, I think, uh, I think we've covered the show as well as we have time for. So um, I thank you very much for uh, coming in and sharing with us. And uh, I hope to see you again next time for another edition of Arts and Ideas.